Join your host, Maddie Roche, as she brings you into a community of fee-only financial advisors who are successfully building profitable businesses that serve the next generation of clients. Learn from innovative advisors whose unique stories will inspire you to dream big and take action on your goals. Are you ready to live your best life and help your clients live theirs? Then you're in the right place. Hello, and welcome to XYPN Radio. I'm Maddie Roach, your host. Today, I have the privilege of talking to two compliance experts and women whom I get to call teammates. Taria Hang and Shelby Brown are two of XYPN's compliance coaches, and together they bring nearly two decades of experience as examiners and compliance consultants to the XYPN team and membership. Today, we discuss their approach to compliance, the time commitment that they recommend advisors take to ensure that they create a culture of compliance within their organization. And of course, we riff about things that may or may not keep our IA owners up at night when it comes to compliance. Taria and Shelby give really great advice in today's episode. They talk about trusting your instinct and give valuable insight into how regulators and examiners approach their own jobs. They discuss how compliance changes when you add a teammate or four, when you approach SEC registration, and when you make a serious mistake. Terry and Shelby's perspective on compliance is refreshing, and I can't help but absorb some of their energy and passion around compliance, and I'm sure you will too. If you're interested in how compliance responsibilities will evolve as you scale your firm, the show is going to be for you. Avocado toast, selfies a mountain of student loan debt. Gen Y is anything but traditional, and with over 75 million people, it's a population you don't want to ignore. Learn more about how to serve this unique population in our guide called Attract and Profitably Serve Millennial Clients in Your RIA. Discover three key ways to tap into the millennial market and six things that they want from their financial advisor. Visit xyplanningnetwork.com slash millennials for your free copy. You can find any of the resources we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 305. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to join our private group just for XYPN radio listeners. It's the community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. Again, that's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Shelby and Teria. Hello and welcome to XYPN Radio, Teria and Shelby. How are you both this morning? Doing well. Thanks for having us. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having us, Maddie. Absolutely. It's uh, it's always a good day when I can interview two of my wonderful teammates at XYPN. Uh, today we're talking all about advanced compliance with some of our badass compliance consultants. I'm going to start off, of course, with just a discussion of our backgrounds and and what you both bring to the compliance team at XYPN. It it really doesn't feel like that long ago that our compliance team was itty bitty and now it's one of our largest teams. uh, And I'm proud to call you both colleagues. uh, And I know our members have really, really enjoyed tapping into your expertise. So, Terry, I'm going to let you start it off. Just let the listeners know who you are and, and what you bring to Team XYPN. Sure. So my name is Teria and I'm a compliance consultant here. I have been doing compliance for the last decade, which is crazy. I actually had this discussion this morning that before when I was filing U4s for people, I was really young in my early 20s and all these advisors were much older than I was. And now I'm at that age where I'm like, they are the same years I was born. It's just kind of crazy. Um, but I started off um, at a law firm slash compliance firm in LA, um, dealing with breakaway brokers, broker protocol, and assisting with that transition for advisors. And then I ended up actually becoming a financial examiner for the Texas State Securities Board for six years. So I would do on-site inspections for registered investment advisors all throughout Texas. Um, got to travel a lot through Texas to, you know, gas country, to the panhandle. It's very interesting. And then I did a little stint going back into the law firm capacity as a paralegal in, again, securities law. And now I'm here at XYPN and loving it. 
Wow. What a career. Cheers to you. Uh, it's always fun to pass the decade of, of work experience. And I, I feel you on uh, finally being the age of the people you're working with. <laughs> Shelby, I'd be interested in the same question to you. What is your background? What do you bring to Team XYPN? Yeah, so a uh, different route than Teria, and we found ourselves in the same spot, which I always find super interesting. Um, I like to say I inherited <laughs> compliance. I uh, did other jobs for um, an SEC registered investment advisor, worked there for about a decade, um, all through college, and then a little bit after college, um, and the, the gal in the compliance role uh, departed for a new firm. So again, I inherited the job without really knowing what I was getting myself into, but um, started some education at the same time. And the, the on the job training and the education suite that I was working through was really just kind of the perfect side-by-side -side for me. It, it clicked instantly. Compliance just fits with my brain. So I liked it, decided to stick with it, uh, became a consultant for a while and um, have, have worked with investment advisors only via fee only investment advisors for about five years now. So not quite a decade, but hopefully some decades from now, we'll still be doing the same thing. And uh, when I found XY, I just felt it was serendipitous. This is my spot. I love, I love it here and love being able to consult for so many members in, in different walks of life, different phases of their business, but all still fee only investment advisors. Totally. Oh, I love that. Uh, there's there's always such energy around the teammates who do compliance at XYPN, um, despite working with members on the topic that often makes their, their stomach jump uh, with nerves. So uh, it's kind of nice, hopefully, for our listeners to hear um, some humanization of the compliance world. Um, but Teria, bring us back to kind of post-college. What drew you to compliance? I, I must say, compliance was not on my radar when I graduated college. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it would definitely, you know, it's not a major in college, you really major in. Um, so I guess in that mindset, it's, um, I guess I fell into it as well, like Shelby did. What drew me to compliance? I think I'm a very critical person. <laughs> and so a lot of compliance is telling people what they're doing wrong. And so I kind of like that. <laughs> it's just like, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. Um, and it's also just very detail oriented, which is probably my main strength. And so I just love a job where I can, I can do it well. Beautiful. And just to summarize to our listeners, Teria, would you kind of describe your role at XYPN in just a few sentences? Um, so I work with members as a compliance coach. So basically, if any questions members have in regards to compliance, either teaching them how to deal with that or guiding them or assisting with those tasks. Beautiful. And Shelby, would you add anything to that? Um, I, that was well said, Terry. I like just how you intro that. And also, in, in addition to coaching, I also host our office hours for existing firms and kind of try to focus on our education suite of things that we can provide to members um, and also some internal education for our team and just beefing up our, our knowledge internally. Like we said, I don't think that any one of our consultants knows everything on their own, but as a team, we certainly do. Mm, I love that. Even as we were jumping onto this podcast, these two were, were giving each other tips on uh, how to how to approach different deficiency letters, things like that. So the work never stops. And Terry, uh, I'd be interested after all these years of being not just a regulator, but now a coach in the space, you must have developed some sort of attitude towards compliance, a theory around it. What, what is your approach to compliance and how you communicate kind of the responsibilities to, say, just a registered advisor like our members? It's always cheesy to say this, but obviously you want to create that culture of compliance. This is always repeated in every compliance conference, but it's true in that some you can tell right away whether a, a member or an advisor cares about compliance or whether they don't <laughs> or whether they know what they're talking about or whether they or whether they don't. And so it's just educating yourself and knowing how to think in that compliance mindset. And then that culture gets developed. 
Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've heard that culture of compliance. And Shelby, I'd be interested, how do you coach on that? I mean, how, how do you even begin the conversations about you need to care more about this? I think um, I tell people a lot to trust their instincts. It's, you know, I think we inherently have ethically great people in our membership base and just kind of in our in our fee only advisor world in general. Um, we're, we're pretty safe and, like I said, inherently ethical, easy to, for us to provide good service and be good people. So when I say trust your instincts, I think, you know, if something is rubbing you the wrong way or, or you're unsure about something, that's when to take it further, do some more research and make sure that you do have a good understanding and, and just kind of push that feeling away. Um, recognize it, but address it. And I think that that helps build confidence. That's a huge key in pushing down that tone of compliance from the CCO down through the rest of the firm. Mm, Great. And Terry, when you begin a relationship in the XYPN world with a member, um, what are their biggest concerns as they engage either coaching or consulting on compliance? Uh, The biggest concern that I get is I don't know what I don't know is that they just don't know what they should be doing and they don't know, you know, what is compliance and what's not compliance, what they should be thinking about in terms of compliance. And they're just scared. They're just scared that they are going to do something wrong because they don't know whether they can do something or can't. From your experience, Teria, what is worst case scenario with not keeping a culture of compliance at a firm? I mean, (laughs) worst case scenario is that you get an order and lose your business. (laughs) That is worst case scenario or a massive fine. And that comes from things that unfortunately are somewhat common, like unregistered activity is a common um, event. If someone was providing advice and not registered, hopefully that doesn't happen, but that can be something that can get you fined or an order that's on your public permanent record. So those are things we try to avoid. Yeah. Shelby, what's your experience with kind of major red flags in the space? Um, I hear the, I hear the same thing a lot. I don't know what I don't know. And so in order to figure those things out, I think our membership has access to each other, which is huge. Um, using your colleagues to gain their past experiences, especially if you're in a similar geographic location or um, your, you know, your regulators are the same jurisdiction, it can be very helpful to just see what people have experienced in the past, see their take on maybe a new idea that you have that you want to workshop. And compliance consulting can always be a part of that. You can spend a very short amount of time with a consultant and get very, very far answering some of those don't know what you don't know questions. um, And even having a consultant just help you figure out what those questions are, formulate them for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Shelby, I know one of the biggest concerns, of course, as advisors start their practices is that they're going to they're going to set up the, the culture the right way and that they can commit the amount of time that they need to do it. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the, the time commitment aspect change and evolve as a firm gets older? Yeah, I think with everything compliance, there's a little bit more work to do in the front end of things to prepare yourself for ease of use and efficiency with with everything compliance going forward. So I think that's what kind of feels funny. People have a hard time just getting over that first speed bump of, okay, I've I've accomplished becoming registered, now what? (laughs) And the now what for compliance can seem huge when you first get introed into your ongoing compliance responsibilities. So spending a little more time in the front end of things to set yourself up for success on an ongoing basis is always my recommendation. And then on an ongoing basis, you really can work it for you about how much time you need to spend on compliance and can spend on compliance. I mean, Teria, I'm curious if you agree, but I would say, you know, in a one person firm, like a lot of our members are, you're probably fine spending an hour or two per month on compliance. Honestly, it's, you know, an hour every other week or an hour every week, just blocked out on your calendar when um, you can just think about compliance and Mm. try not to ignore that alert on your calendar. And if all that means is coming up with questions to ask, 
that that's still progress. I agree. Yeah. I, I love that Shelby, what you just said, the questions to ask, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So I think, um, office hours, is sort of what's guiding my brain there is we have these open Q and A sessions all the time with members who are up and running in their businesses, they're approved, they're serving clients and still trying to figure out where to fit in compliance into their daily just business life. Being a business owner and being an advisor, there's a lot of things that go along with that. And oftentimes compliance is the last thing you have room for in your mind and your schedule. So I think, I think that can tailor just sort of your attitude around it in, in general. Mm. Great. Terry, I love this idea that an, a solo advisor can think about spending maybe an hour or two on compliance per month. But I imagine the stress of compliance, they probably spend several more hours worried about. Um, can you speak to that a bit? Um, sure. I think. Shelby also said this, but being a fee-only advisor, you inherently have lower risk than most advisors out there. And I think there's a, a fear amongst a lot of members and advisors of compliance, and maybe that fear actually deters them from working on compliance. But honestly, it shouldn't be so fearful. Like, again, you have low risk. And so it's really just getting over the fear and the burden of compliance and just thinking of of checklists of just like things you should watch out for and document and documenting things and reviewing those documents and making sure that they're accurate. Yeah. When you say low risk, I, I think though about kind of what your your worst case scenario is, which is your firm could get, you know, fined or you could get, you know, you could be asked to close your firm. When you say lower risk, are you, are you talking kind of in comparison to say the broker dealer environment where, where you just, you can't do anything? Yes. Um, lower risk in terms of conflicts of interest, because people who aren't fee only have long a laundry list of conflicts of interest that they must disclose and find ways to mitigate lower risk in terms of if lower employee number of employees. So a lot of our members are solo firms. If you, the more employees you have, the more supervision responsibility you have as a CCO to make sure that none of those employees are going against any compliance rules. So really your responsibilities are less and less uh, depending on your size. Great. Shelby, I'd love to continue this, this line of questions about as you grow your firm, how does compliance evolve? Yeah, really the supervision aspect, I think, is a huge part of it. If you plan to add people to your firm who will be working for you, it is, you know, the CCO's responsibility to, as Terry said, make sure that everyone in the firm is remaining compliant, not just the firm itself, but the people, their actions, uh, how they how they look in the public, how they talk about the firm in the public space, you know, that all needs to be consistent with the messaging of, of the firm, the branding of the firm and, you know, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. There's quite a bit of freedom in compliance when you just disclose what's happening. So as far as supervising, that can take, it can seem more of a burden because it just takes more of your attention and more of your time. And um, I think, you know, in a one person firm, even as that firm grows without the supervision component, you know, increasing, um, you will have more, more clients to pay attention to, uh, more, more billing and invoicing processes to just check and make sure that that's all tight. Um, there are just the volume of, of clients of AUM, for instance, can just affect your, your testing, your checks, and just the time that you spend on compliance. I think just growing in volume, doesn't make you more risky. However, I do want to just make, you know, make that clear. Um, I think again, it's just the more volume of, of your, your documentation and your processes and compliance that can seem like more, um, just with volume, but it's not that you are less safe because you're bigger for any reason. And I also just want to add about the, you know, when we're talking about worst case scenario, I think we can also talk about best case scenario after, um, an audit setting or an interaction with a regulator. 
which, it, you know, they want to see that you are looking for holes and just trying to fill them. No firm is perfect. It's very rare that uh, you will come out of an audit with no comments and no deficiencies to speak of. Um, they just like to tell you to do things and like to see that you're paying attention. It's very rare that after your first or even second or third audit that you will be disciplined unless you're purposefully doing something wrong, intentionally forgetting things, closing those compliant alert compliance alerts that you have on your calendar every time they come up, repeat offenses. That's when you'll be disciplined and get in trouble. So I think that takes a lot of the scariness away too. Just about that looming first audit is they really just want to see your understanding around compliance and kind of your your method for looking for holes and planning to fill them. Great. Teria, any thoughts on that? I 100% agree. You know, being on the regulator side, you also have to think of it as like, when I was an examiner, of course, I'm going to do a deficiency letter or else it doesn't look like I'm doing my job and like <laughs> finding deficiency. Um, so I, yeah, I think, again, when I was an examiner and visited advisors some of them were very nervous and scared or fearful of the inspection and we always told them you know there should be no fear you know if you're doing everything correctly then or if you're not intentionally harming clients then it's really we were there to educate them on what their books and records requirements were you know and at the end, it's it's only to assist them in protecting their firm and their clients. Um, so it, it wasn't any, we weren't there to punish them or to try to find something to create a fine. We're not, you know, no. trying to find speeding tickets. Yeah, it, does. <laughs> yeah, it, w- it wouldn't look great on the, you know, for the state if, if, everyone that came out of an audit was getting disciplined and closing their yeah. doors and get, paying fines. So, you know, they want their advisors to be good and do better and understand how to be compliant. I think the rules can be so intricate at times that um, often an audit helps really to make, to bring your understanding of, of what you need to do a compliance sphere full circle, because there's really no better resource to pick through your stuff and tell you what needs to happen than, than that audit. So yeah, totally. Oh, I love that. Um, if I was an advisor here in Montana and I had just opened my firm or maybe was adding my first employee, could I call the regulator and just ask them for kind of like a, a, to help me go through things? I mean, what what is the ideal relationship from the examiner's perspective that RIAs have with them? Terry, I'll let you answer that first. Yeah, most uh, state regulators will tell you that they cannot give advice and to consult your attorney because they can't give advice. They can only tell you what the rules are and point you to the rules and you are supposed to interpret that. That's not to say you can't reach out to examiners if you have questions and they will be there to answer your questions and having them point to the rule does help. So it's always good to know who your regulator is, your examiner is and have a good relationship with them. But sometimes don't expect an answer. (laughs) Interesting. I didn't realize that they can't give advice. So even Mm -hmm. in those deficiency letters, they're not telling you you need to do stuff. They're just telling you whether you're over the line or off of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can kind of push back on some of those comments because they can somewhat be subjective or give you their opinion or really just be asking you more information. And some advisors think, oh, this is the rule when it's not the rule. It's just them being inquisitive. Interesting. Shelby, what's your experience in that? Uh, I agree that that's, that is what I've seen in the past too. And I think it is, it's never a bad idea to try to reach out because really just the clarification of the actual words of a rule or where it lives is sometimes what we can't find and and that helps. So as an answer, sometimes that that is what what we need. Um, even as consultants, we try this too. I mean, we we email questions to state regulators, to the SEC, and very, you know, we get mixed responses. <laughs> uh, half the time it's sorry, we can't give you advice. And then the other half of the time is, well, here's the rule. Here's what the rule says. So I appreciate those responses just because it's a response. Um, and I think that, you know, the regulator, I, 
oftentimes I hear from members, they're afraid to reach out because they yeah. think that they're going to be like moving themselves higher on the list or uh, they'll think, oh, this regulator is going to think I don't know what I'm doing because I have a question. But we, you know, we try and combat that feeling as much as we can. That That's typically not the tone that they take and they will appreciate the want to know more and the want to educate yourselves and the want to be better. So that won't make you more prone to an audit just for asking a question. <laughs> totally. I'm so glad you said that because I, early on when I was working a lot with members, I would hear over and over again that they didn't want to flag themselves for the regulator. So I was like, well, yeah. you're, you're on their books no matter what. <laughs> um, and, and I'm interested, Terry, where do advisors go to learn more about their rules? I mean, is it, is it, do they need to be making flashcards on what these are or do you kind of do this as you start your firm or are you revisiting it kind of throughout the year? Yeah, it's hard. Honestly, I think one of the reasons why compliance is hard, because it's actually hard to get information. Like some of these state rules are like embedded somewhere out in the world and it's hard to find and it's hard to read and understand. But I think XYPN does a great job with its compliance education, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and, um, and like Shelby said, the forums that XYPN has, rely, you know, helps with um, communicating with other members and communicating with your regulator if you can do that. Otherwise, publications that come out from regulators, it's really just this section of the industry um, has a lot of information and digesting that information and just where to find it can be a plethora of places. XYPN is one of it with our compliance corner, compliance corner newsletter that co- goes out and as well as attending existing office hours. Yeah, great. I'm wondering as firms get larger, they register in different states. That means they're sub, you know, subject to different state regulations. Um, Shelby, how does that complicate or increase the amount of time advisors are spending if they're serving clients all around the country? Yeah, so certain states have some specific rules related to specific services and just certain ways they like to see them disclosed. And they take that direction really because they're protecting protecting their investors. They want the clients to be fully informed about what will happen and what will go on and what they will receive for the fee that they're putting out. And really the documentation and compliance around all of that is, is, is it reasonable? Are your fees reasonable based on the service you're providing? All of that kind of thing. So I think documenting that is is what can be a battle because it's usually just your nature. I mean, you're working naturally, you're doing your everyday thing and tracking it in certain ways and taking time out of your just day-to-day work to document little pieces of things can feel very disruptive at times. But I think with the goal in mind of knowing that it is needed, necessary, and good for you to do, you, you know, you will do them trying to find the answers and and using all the resources that are out there, I think can be overwhelming just because there's so much out there. And even as consultants, we're sorting through rules and regulations oftentimes to try and make a consistency across (laughs) jurisdictions. Several states, as Terry mentioned, are very vague about their rules or they're so in like, you know, 10, 20 clicks into their secretary of state website, you finally actually find the rules and there's no summary of any rules. And, you know, maybe the website was last updated in 2015 or you know something like that. So in, in the absence of the clear and present answer, like right in front of you, uh, there is a lot of digging around that you have that you could have to do for certain states sometimes. So it primarily your home state will be who audits you Mm -hmm. as far as, you know, firm financials, uh, your, you know, minimum net capital requirements. If your jurisdiction has that, um, every so often an out of state advisor will be examined by, um, by a state that is not their home state, but typically those are more narrowly focused to just the clients in that state and, and they're more abbreviated in process. So there's a, a very small notion of just another regulator to answer to possibly in the future. Um, but the, with that said, the overarching rules that kind of shape our whole industry 
are pretty standardized. And so in the absence of being able to find an exact answer, you can go with Mm. what the SEC says. (laughs) That's usually what we, and the SEC being a federal body is very, uh, is much more robust about putting out their regulations, sending alerts, telling us who gets disciplined and why, what changes they're making, all those kinds of things. The states are a lot slower to, to release that type of news, but more often than not, they piggyback on what the SEC is doing in the absence of having their own regulation around it. So at the highest level, if you really just need an answer right away, Google your question just with investment advisor next to it and SEC rules should come up and give you some information. And then if you need to dig further for a specific state, sometimes that's when asking a regulator can come in handy. (laughs) Mm, Fascinating. Terry, any thoughts on that? No, I completely agree. And it, you know, again, and like these things are are hard to figure out and it, it helps, you know, to have these compliance resources through XYPN to, to really try to find the answer. Because the hardest part, the hardest part is finding out the question. <laughs> and the second hardest part is finding the answer. Right, right different ways to approach it. You know, can I, can I publish a blog or what are the rules on marketing? You know, there's two different ways of kind of looking into those questions. And um, I know that they, they vary state to state. And I wonder, Teria, from your experience as an examiner, how much does the state think about that? That, you know, what, what Texas may require is completely different than North Carolina. Any discussion or thought on that? Texas could not care what North Carolina does. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that on the record. <laughs> yeah, for, I mean, I can't speak on other states, but for Texas, we just concentrate on Texas. Um, and we definitely, you know, work with the SEC and attend, you know, communicate with FINRA and the SEC to make sure that we're relay, re, you know, relaying the same information to advisors and informing one another about bad actors in the industry or things to look out for. But uh, for the most part, most states conform uh, with their rules generally. It's just like little small nuances here and there. Yeah. Oh, love it. Okay. So let's talk about how an advisor could avoid doing compliance. What are their options, Shelby? Uh, well, there's little pieces that you'll always just have to have your hand in as the CCO, you know, your your signature on on the paper, just a couple of things. And in that supervisory aspect of things, if you do have, you know, more than one person in the firm, the supervisory aspect of compliance will, will not go away. <laughs> but you can outsource uh, compliance tasks. I think outsourcing the role of CCO is maybe a different discussion that it can function properly, but it can often take quite a bit of explaining and demonstrating via, you know, with documenting how that is feasible, efficient, and compliant and why that is the best option for the firm. I think that oftentimes regulators view that as kind of the last option. So they really want to know why that was selected, but outsourcing just the or I should say using a consultant to work alongside you, to educate you, to train you um, how to do the things that you need to do and not just going through your checklist and checking things off because an alert popped up on your computer, but actually knowing what you're checking while you're in the check and therefore your findings or non-findings are much more significant in that respect. So if you're looking for something on a quarterly basis, I'll just use fee billing as an example. On a regular basis, it's good to just go back and check and make sure that your your billing and invoicing was done as you want it to be done, just to make sure that you haven't missed anything or made any mistakes. It happens and it's fine, but this is why we check so that we find them. And I think advisors will, you know, especially in their first year of business, do this check quarter after quarter, maybe three, four quarters in a row, and then say, oh, I'm not finding anything. I never find anything whenever I'm looking for compliance stuff. And that can feel like such a drag, (laughs) but that's what you want. 
you want to look and not find anything. So I think after a few quarters of that cadence, it become it settles better with the the advisor. But I think that that can be be a drag at first. So you feel like you're finding nothing, but that's what you want. So just kind of training yourself to be comfortable with that. Yeah, great. Terry, from your experience, could you give us an example of maybe a major issue that an advisor that you were examining came across and and how did they deal with it effectively? I mean, what if, if you really do figure out that you had a big mistake, what's the appropriate course of action? An example of an advisor, I mean, it really depends on the severity of the case. And honestly, you know, when we find large deficiencies with advisors, being a good person <laughs> really helps. So it's the attitude of the advisor, whether they actually care or if they are kind of just thinking it's not a big deal. When to us, that's again, not the best one trying to have a culture of compliance. So having the intention to correct your mistakes and to inform your clients and to look at the best interests of your clients versus yourself or your firm, that helps a lot. So if we know that they are going to correct the mistake, the mistake either being a billing mistake or failing to have signed agreements or failing to disclose an outside business activity. Like those are kind of smaller issues that can be corrected. Large issues of billing on things you shouldn't be billing on or large disparities in billing or getting compensation that's not disclosed. I mean, those can be larger issues. And again, being a good person and being willing to fix those corrections can really help. And if you were to catch, say, oh, I've, I've overbilled this, you know, all of my clients, a hundred dollars, I didn't list it, my ADV. How do you make good on that? I mean, do you tell your clients and then do you call the regulator and let them know that that happened or is it just documentation? It's just documentation. Okay. Yeah. Telling the client, keeping a log, putting action, you know, what happened, who was, who was affected, how did you correct the action and how to prevent the action in the future? Beautiful. Shelby, thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say is um, in your right, Terry, I'd be honest, <laughs> taking it seriously, but not over seriously. And I think by that, I just mean, you know, there are certain people who just don't like being told what to do. And <laughs> in an audit setting, that's, that's all that's happening, especially once you receive your deficiency letter. And so they can, it, it, your attitude helps a lot. If you envision it as someone just micromanaging you and trying to make things inefficient for you, trying to make you seem like a bad advisor to your clients, you know, if that's, if that's the tone, then it's, it's going to be a bumpier road. Um, If you just accept and agree with, you know, their findings and like Terry said, make plans to uh, fix that. And then in your policies and procedures, make sure that we detail what preventative measures we put in place to stop that from happening again. Um, I think that there's a learn, you can, take away as a learning experience from any deficiency that you get, you know, provided with. So just addressing them and moving on is going to be better for everyone, including your clients. I think, yes, being, being inf- informing clients is one thing. Informing regulators is typically not needed. So they will say, did you inform your clients? And so if as long as you can document and prove that, that's what you want. Interesting. I I love this idea that the fiduciary commitment does not stop when you have a compliance issue that that you have to you have to continue to put your client's best interests first, not your own. Um, what an interesting approach mentally to if if you were to stumble upon a major error, it's not just fixing it so that your business stays in business. You still have that fiduciary oath, Shelby. What are your thoughts in terms of how do the regulators look at that fiduciary oath? And, and I assume they're regulating folks that aren't all fiduciaries. Yeah, they are. And so really, I think it comes down to another kind of big tagline for compliance, which is, you know, do what you say and say what you do. If I mean, that is there's a lot of freedom in compliance when that is what's happening. You know, your documents need to be matching your actions. And that's almost as simple as it is. (laughs) So when it comes to like trying to speak to that, I think 
really usually the documents speak for themselves. Yeah. Terry, I'm dying. Do we have more sayings in the compliance world that we have not talked about? I love this. Do as you say, say as you do uh, in the culture of compliance. What uh, Culture of compliance. Don't know what we don't know. Mm-hmm. What are the others? There's got to be more. <laughs> oh, I know the age old compliance answer that you will all get from a compliance consultant sometime in your life, which will come with more after, but <laughs> it's it depends. <laughs> that's uh, that's the yeah, that's compliance answer. Usually, um, uh, that's how I answer a lot of questions. And I'll almost sometimes stop myself and say, well, I hate to say this, but it depends. And a good consultant will go on to what it depends on. And, mm. and, and yeah. it, they will help you formulate an answer and, mm. and you know, complete the thought. But that flies out of our mouths sometimes, for sure. <laughs> awesome. I love that. I'm interested in, in both of your ideas around women in this industry, there's a lot of different avenues we can all take. I I thought I at one point would be a financial advisor. Nope, not going to happen. I will not be. Uh, And and therefore, I'm, you know, my position here at XYPN. Um, Each of you have had, you know, different, very interesting, beautiful roles in this industry. And I would love to talk directly to those listeners, male or female or other, um, that are considering a role, maybe at an RIA. Maybe they don't love financial planning, but there's, there's a career path here, isn't there, Teria? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in an RA, you have many different roles as you would in any company, marketing to client relationships to compliance. Compliance is a great role for someone who's very detail oriented and who is very organized. I think those are probably the two biggest characteristics you need. Yeah. And Shelby, how do you see staff members taking over the role of chief compliance officer? Because one of the things we did talk about prior to recording this is that someone at your firm has to have that title. It doesn't have to be the firm owner. Any tips to those listeners who maybe do want to join a firm, not as the owner, but take over compliance as CCO? Yeah, that's a great question. And I used to work in the compliance department, but not as the CCO for that SEC registered firm that I mentioned um, in the beginning of our chat. And that was a good way to work it is you can do all the things and just not have the title. And then you don't need to be, you know, you're not a registered person. You're not serving clients. You're serving the firm. You are keeping the, you know, your, the compliance department is kind of who you supervise, what you supervise. Um, So it's definitely workable like that. Someone can, I think after maybe some time, getting orientated into the compliance program of a firm in that manner could take the role and title of CCO eventually. I I think it feels heavier than it actually is on paper. Just having that C in front of your name, um, it can feel like you have an extreme amount of liability, which is just being put on a person by having that title. The firm has the liability that it has. It it, it always will, you you know, the duties you owe to clients, your fiduciary oath, that will never go away. But, you know, what what you can do as the CCO is not, doesn't need, you don't need to be registered even to, to just be the CCO. So I think firms that function the best in compliance that have multiple employees have a designated CCO and someone else who's also help assisting the CCO um, in just those kind of ongoing tasks. And it, and it can function with just a CCO, of course, obviously. But I think the more that the compliance department is only focusing on compliance, that's just going to make things run smoother for the firm. Those people will have more time. They will be those detail-oriented people who the the tasks are geared for and who are good at those tasks. So you can definitely have help. It does not need to all be the CCO. And being the CCO, for that matter, is not as scary as it sounds. Um, You may be the one, you know, face-to-face with uh, in an audit, with a regulator if you are the CCO of a multi-member firm, but 
that's also not the scariest part of an audit, honestly. Um, I think as we've led up to in today's conversation, it's it's more the hunting and gathering and delivering of things prior to the audit that that's intimidating and more work than being face to face with a regulator is typically the smooth part of things. You know, you're talking about your fees and services. It's almost what you do with clients on a daily basis. So. I think uh, even if you had to be that person with the C in front of your name in that audit setting, you wouldn't give that to a person in the firm who you weren't sure was could handle that and was uh, cap- willing and capable is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, great advice. Well said. But Teria, for those firms and listeners who are state registered currently, but maybe rapidly approaching SEC registration, are, do you have any advice on how to button up their, their compliance? What do they have to prepare for as they look forward to SEC registration? Surprisingly enough, it's actually a little bit, I feel, I feel like it's a little bit easier to be SEC registered than to be state registered. You know, there are a smaller number of state registered advisors in each state. So a lot of regulators are able to audit every single registrar in that state, whereas the SEC has fewer numbers of examiners because they are regulating the entire United States. Um, So I think that their exams are more focused on, they do have like a limited newly registered advisors, but then after that, it's more risk-based where they're kind of only going after advisors who let's say, like have custody or are a little bit or run a hedge fund or a little bit more at risk. And there are some SEC register firms that haven't been examined in several years. And the SEC does have more of a uniform rule, whereas, again, a state advisor may be registered in multiple states. So they have to be informed about all the different states rules and, you know, annual submissions sometimes. And, you know, their contracts have to comply with two different states, whereas the SEC, you just have to go with your home state and then that's it. So it's actually a little bit more of a relief to be SEC registered and you get a little bit more relief from regulators as well. Mm. Fascinating. Okay. So the goal is to get SEC registered. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> um, I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And that is something that XYPN uh, has helped advisors with uh, over the years. And we're going to continue to build out support for SEC registration. In the meantime, working with Shelby and Terry and other uh, XYPN compliance consultants is an option uh, if you join XYPN membership. Um, Shelby and Terry, if you can believe it, we are rounding out this episode. I literally Really could talk about compliance with you two for hours. Uh, Shelby, any final tips of advice to our listeners about handling compliance of a, a busy, maybe multi-staff firm? Um, yeah, I think just don't let it intimidate you. It's it's not as scary as it sounds. And a little bit of legwork in the beginning of things can really make it run efficiently for you on an ongoing basis. And like we said, just a minimal amount of time to dedicate you know, to this area of your brain uh, per month, per quarter um, to keep yourself accountable is really what you need. And, you know, we're here as coaches to increase accountability if that's really all you need is to just someone to give you homework and tell you to do it. (laughs) I love that. I love that. And I, I really have gotten from this interview with you two that the sooner you put your brain towards structuring the compliance department in your firm, the better off you're going to be. That especially I feel during your first year when you've got a lot of time and you don't have all these clients that you could really set up a nice routine for yourself um, as opposed to trying to do it retroactively. Absolutely. Not getting behind and staying organized is going to be beneficial forever. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Awesome. Okay. Teria, how about you? Uh, Any final pieces of advice to our listeners who are contemplating maybe starting their firm and and have a pit in their stomach about compliance? Um, Starting your firm, do it. (laughs) Just don't let compliance take that away from you. That can can be figured out. Um, And you have plenty of resources if you do it with XYPN. In, In terms of tips, my biggest tip is read your documents. That's, I would say the biggest issue is that people are like, oh, you know, I don't actually do that. Or I, I, don't, I think the regulators, I don't know why they're 
you know, being so nitpicky about this, like, well, it says here you do this. <laughs> so read your documents. That's uh, my biggest advice. I think people just uh, rely on either us to read their documents for them um, or the templates that they receive. But you got to read your documents, people. Totally. Totally. You got to read your documents so you can see if your clients would understand them when they read them. Yes, they're exactly. Supposed to, they're supposed to be written in layman's terms, yeah? Yes, yes. And so you can say what you do and do what you do say. What you say. <laughs> okay, you heard it out of the mouths of Shelby and Terria today, folks. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, you've been wonderful teammates, and I know uh, the members who have worked with you have been uh, really honored to work with you and uh, found you both to be very helpful. So I hope our listeners do too. Uh, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Avocado toast, selfies, a mountain of student loan debt. Gen Y is anything but traditional, and with over 75 million people, it's a population you don't want to ignore. Learn more about how to serve this unique population in our guide called Attract and Profitably Serve Millennial Clients in Your RIA. Discover three key ways to tap into the millennial market and six things that they want from their financial advisor. Visit xyplanningnetwork.com millennials for your free copy. Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYPN radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes, and finally, to find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You are not alone and you are not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the cutting edge financial planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com forward slash VIP or text XYPN radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients.